a pleasure uh, to welcome Professor Ilka Brunner from uh, the LMU at Munich, uh, who will talk to us today about defects and brain transport in abelian gauged linear sigma models. And before she gets started, just wanted to remind you everybody about the poster session uh, later today. We'll also remind you again at the end of the talk. But please go ahead, Professor Brunner. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk at this conference. Um, so my talk will be about um, brain transport using defects, and I will focus on abelian gauge linear sigma models. Um, these are uh, two-dimensional uh, supersymmetric gauge theories, and my gauge group in this talk will be abelian and, in fact, may mostly a single U1 factor. Um, such models were investigated in the past, so uh, initially by Witten in a famous paper from the 90s, and it's well known that uh, such gauge theories can have uh, several phases, uh, for example, a Landau-Ginsburg phase or geometric phase characterized by um, certain degrees of gauge symmetry breaking. So in the landau ginsburg phase, this initial abelian gauge group is broken to some discrete ZD subgroup, and in the geometric phase, it would be entirely broken. And so now the question I'm trying to address in this talk is how, how we can transport data in a natural way from one phase to another or more generally from some UV theory to some IR theory or phase. And my data that I want to, uh, to be transported is mostly uh, categories of boundary conditions on which these defects um, operate as functors, or in other words, in string theory words, uh, D-brains. And this talk is based on two, two recent uh, papers uh, with Daniel Roggenkamp and uh, two students, first with Fabian Klos and the second with uh, Lukas Krumpek. Okay, so like Nadav, I felt insecure about what to present on the first slide when talking about defects to this audience. Um, so I will talk about two-dimensional, mostly topological field theories, but also more generally uh, conformal field theories and consider one-dimensional defect lines, which separate or connect, depending on what you want to emphasize, two possibly different two-dimensional uh, CFT, so like drawn in this picture, this is the defect. You have the CFT one here and the CFT two there. And um, on this defect, you can have some uh, degrees of freedom that don't live in the bulk, but that couple to, to the bulk physics. Then one point of view you can have on such defects is you can regard them as boundaries of folded theories. So fold this up here and have this picture, and then you have a boundary condition for the tensor product of these CFTs. So among other things, defects are boundaries for folded theories, but they are more than that in the sense that they can be moved, merged, and intersect, and things like this. Okay, um, so I'm interested in special in a special class of defects, namely uh, flow defects, or also called RG domain walls, that separate some UV theory to its perturbation, so to its IR theory generated by a certain perturbation of the initial theory. Um, so that's drawn in this picture. So I start with. Um, some initial theory called UV theory, I draw in a trivial defect line, so just the identity defect that does nothing. And then I imagine that I perturb on the side of that defect line and on that side only and flow to a perturbed or IR theory. So doing that, I will generate some defect that builds up here. So that's how you can think about it. And then I want to use this thing to transport my boundary conditions. And that works 
roughly like this. So this is a rough picture. So I start with a boundary condition for my UV theory. I want to turn it into some consistent boundary um, for an IR theory. So I glue this picture over here. So that glues IR to this UV, I still the boundary is for the UV theory. And now to create an IR boundary condition, I move this line over here. Um, okay, that's a nice picture to which I want to give some substance in the situation of the gauged linear sigma models uh, during this talk. Um, so let me have one look at these RG or deformation defects in, folded, in the folded picture where the defect is a boundary for a folded theory. And I would like to look at geometrical models where you have a sigma model with some target geometry. And the, for the picture that I draw, I take the simplest one, three boson on a circle S1 uh, with the radius R. So the pictures on the previous slide would look like this. So I have a picture with a UV and an IR theory. And um, what I want to look at is the case where this uh, UV theory is a boson compactified at radius R, and this is a deformed boson where this is compactified at radius R prime. So in a target space picture, I could draw this identity defect that I have uh, initially, so my initial picture was like this, U, V, U, V, R, R, and then the perturbation leads to the second picture. Um, this picture would look like this, so a diagonal brain on the doubled circle. And then if I deform the radius, I get a deformed identity that looks like this. And this can also be done in more complicated geometries or more interesting theories in general. So what features do we have for these RG defects? So first of all, they are not topological. So I kind of indicated that I want to use them as functors for boundary conditions. So I would like to move the defect to some boundary. So um, if a defect is not Topological, it means in other words, that it cannot be moved around freely. Um, in fact, this kind of limiting the perturbation and letting the defect build up uh, is some, you can think about it. Yeah, it has to encode somehow the whole um, perturbation theory approach to boundary perturbation theory and hence um, the fusion with other defects or boundary must be highly singular and difficult or even impossible to compute in general situations. So we go to some favorable situation where we can make use of this merging procedure. And that's to look at supersymmetric theories where we can look at nicely behaved subsectors in particular topological subsectors. Okay, so we can, use if we go to a topological theory, then any, anything is topological and we can compute the fusion. So now what's special about these flow defects in a topological theory? So we can look at this picture where we kind of squeeze in a piece of UV theory um, into the IR theory and now as um, this is just the perturbation of this, I can imagine to make this UV theory P smaller. And then what I will obtain is just the invisible line for the IR theory. Um, this makes heavily use of the smoothness of the, uh, of the merging operation. So in particular, I can write this as this defect composed with that is the identity. And then as a consequence of that, if I do it the other way around, so I squeeze in the IR in the UV, so UV has more information than IR, but then if I 
merge these two in that direction as a consequence of this property, this thing will be a projector. So I have that this P squared equals P. So it's a projector inside the UV theory. Okay, so I would like to make use of these constructions in the context of a gauged linear sigma model. Um, as I said, I would like to look at the abelian case. In fact, only one in my examples in this talk, I only consider a single U1 factor, but for any abelian gauge theory with n equals two comma two supersymmetry as some meta multiplets um, coupled to the theory um, will result in a potential for the scalars in the meta multiplets. So here I have, yeah charged matter multiplets yi and the scalars are here. Um, it will result in some potential for the scalars that is written here. So there are some d terms and some f terms and some stuff coming from the gauge uh, sector, which also contains the uh, scalars and the gauge multiplets. And if we look at the classical vacuum manifold, U equals zero modulo gauge transformations. It's clear that it depends on RA, which are the Fayeliopoulos parameters. So the classes of examples I'd like to consider um, are first of all examples with a geometric phase. So I'm sure you have seen this uh, before somewhere. So the field content would here would be here to break up these multiplets y into one thing that is that has negative charge and several xi coordinates that have charge one and to introduce a homogeneous superpotential of this form. So polynomial in the xi times this p. And then for very large r, we enter a geometric phase um, where these xi fields become coordinates on some uh, projective space. And this g, this equation gxi equals zero coming from these f terms um, specifies a hypersurface in that projective space. And um, for r much smaller to than zero, um, we enter. Uh, okay, then uh, maybe I'll talk. Sorry. That's my fault. I'm sorry. I was trying to get somebody off my line. Okay. Uh, so let me know when there's a question. Um, okay. So there's this phase and there's this other phase um, where R is much smaller than zero and where we enter a stringy Lando Ginsburg phase where this P gets a vacuum expectation value and Z gauge symmetry is broken to a discrete ZD subgroup if the initial symmetry was U1. Okay, I also would like to consider examples with uh, several lando ginsburg phases, so no geometric phase, but different lando ginsburg phases. So if, for example, I can consider a model which has a field P and a field X and a homogeneous potential like this, so n is supposed to be smaller than d such that this doesn't get negative. Um, I can assign charges, you want charges to, um, to the fields like this. And again, I have two different phases for r much bigger than zero or smaller than zero. Um, and in each phase, one of these fields will get an expectation value, the other will remain and we get different Lando Ginsburg models. So one time uh, for X, for the R bigger than zero phase, we get uh, a Lando Ginsburg model of a field to power D to the minus N and for the other phase, it's to this power D. Um, so people have studied these kind of models and in particular, in a quantum theory, R gets renormalized. Um, and 
we have a big phase, a large phase, which we can regard as the UV phase, where W is proportional to X to the D and an IR phase where W is proportional to this. Okay, so now we can flow from a UV phase to an IR phase, so between two Landau-Ginsburg models and along this flow, N massive vacuum will decouple to the Coulomb branch. Um, and we can realize both of these phases within the gauge linear sigma model. Um, in the geometric models, um, we can also have decoupling uh, vacuum to some Coulomb branch. So that depends on whether this model is Calabiao or not. Okay, so now what do I want to do? Um, so I would like to consider gauge linear sigma models with different phases. Then I want to discuss the whole thing. Um, so I want to construct somehow defects that um, operate as functors on brain categories. Um, so that means that the, to make sense of everything that I need to go to a topological sector. So here I will go to the B type, so to this holomorphic sector. So any gauge degrees of freedom will be um, decoupled and don't enter the discussion. The only remnant of the gauge theory is some equivariance conditions. So effectively the gauge linear sigma model will be replaced by some U1 equivariant uh, theory of the meta multiplets. Okay, um, then we know how to construct all the brains in the different phases. So for the geometric phase, it's this derived category of coherent sheaves. And for the landau ginsburg phase, it's an orbifold theory. So orbifolds of the category of matrix factorizations of the superpotential. And then we want to construct defects that operate, that map this phase to that, or uh, operate between different landau ginsburg phases. So what's the situation? Um, so we have the gauge linear sigma model. So that's a UV theory that has two different limits of phases. So if I start with this invisible line in the UV, so in the gauge linear sigma model, I would like to, for example, push the two sides to different phases. Um, so to two different Landau-Ginsburg phases or to a geometric into Landau-Ginsburg phase. Um, in particular, this will involve constructing this identity defect of the gauge linear sigma model or in the subsector. Then what I also want to do is to regard this so this maps phase two to phase one. I would like to regard this as a two-step procedure. So first start with phase two, lift it to the gauge linear sigma model, and then go from there to the other phase. And I call the defect um, transition defects and other defect R for flowing down. Mm. So I would like also to look at this embedding into the gauge linear sigma model. And let's have some first considerations on how to get the defect between the phase that lifts the phase to the GLSM. So for example, we could start with an identity defect in a phase. So in the phases, we also know what all the defects are. So one could just start there and try to think how to lift it, lift the phase to the GLSM. So for example, I could have two Lano Ginsburg models um, that have ZD gauge symmetry and lift it um, to gauge linear sigma model on one side. Um, and then we see just from this first consideration that I in particular need to embed this ZD gauge group here and there are different ways to do so. And in particular, there will not be one way of lifting, but several ways of lifting. And one parameter that might enter such a lift is how to embed the gauge group. 
Okay, in general, there are more lifts than amount to flows. And what we really should do, as I also advertised before, is to start from this PLSM identity defect, although it's a bit more difficult to construct it. And then we flow on one side to the face and get this transition defect that maps the face here. So this we can do once we understand the identity defect of the GLSM well enough and also how to push it down to the face on one side. And then we can also combine it with some other defect called R for each face. So each face has an R and a T that is required to embed it. And we can factorize the transition from one phase to another by a T and an R defect. So first lift and then flow to some other phase. Hey, Il Ilka, what yes. are you thinking questions? It looks like we have a question in the audience. Uh, so I didn't notice that. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry, maybe I, I can just speak up. Uh, yeah, a quick question. So the identity defect uh, is obviously topological. Um, is the same the true is the same true for this uh, this I mean this lift defect these TIs are they also topological? No, they are uh, so on the level. So if I were to speak about this full gauge linear sigma model, it would yeah, not be topological. Thing. But I if see. I just restrict to this topological uh, subsector or to the subsector controlled right, by supersymmetry, yes. then it's fine. Yes, I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions? I'm happy to answer questions. Well, okay. I just want to make sure, but the, you would expect all this, um, you know, this, uh, this, this defects, which are not logical before you go twisting to give rise to uh, non-trivial conformal defect in the physical theory, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, super conformal, I, super conformal. Yes, effect. yes. So I think I will comment on it uh, later. Uh, I okay. can say something about the conformal defects in certain situations, of course, only. I see. Mm. But the information, like the the G function, is uh, is accessible from the yes. after the test. Okay. Yes, uh, this I can compute also in more general situations. Okay, I okay. can also comment on it more because in particular in Lando, in the Lando Ginsburg phase, you know how to do it. And also in the geometric phase, you would know how to, how so to extract a certain one point function. So that's what the G factor would be. That's right, that's right. Um, yes. This okay. is possible within the Lando Ginsburg theory, for example. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Anyway, um, so this was, uh, so are there more questions? Okay, then um, let's talk about uh, T and R. Um, so this T thing was a defect that maps the IR to the UV in this uh, direction. And uh, so in particular a phase, if I have several phases, I have a T for each phase. Um, and I can use it, I can use the defect T and that one that goes the other way around to embed the phase into the GLSM. So in particular for each phase, I get such a relation that if I contract the GLSM between the phases using these defects, I get the identity defect of the phase. And as a consequence, I, if I contract, if I let this shrink to zero over the phase, I get a projection operator. And these projectors can be used to realize the brain category of the phase inside the gauge linear sigma model. Um, yeah, so this is my first summary page just from these pictures. Um, I have a category of gauged linear sigma model brains and in, inside it, we can embed brain categories of different phases, uh, use defects to do these embeddings. Um, 
And then inside this GLSM, we can find the brain categories of the phases as projection operator invariant subcategories. So to each, um, by the construction that I presented, we can assign a projection operator to each phase and use it to realize the phase inside this GLSM, inside the category of GLSM brains. Um, you might have seen pictures like the one I presented on the previous slides in other people's papers, uh, in particular Herbst Tory Page paper and um, work by others that followed up on this, discussing the brain transport and GLSM. Um, now the difference of the approach uh, that to the talk that I give now is basically that my toolbox is different. So, um, but I arrive at the same conclusions. Um, so in particular, in you can transport brains like they do in their papers by an analysis of gauge sectors, boundary potentials, and they compute amplitudes on hemispheres and investigate um, certain smoothness properties or how you can an analytically continue these hemisphere um, amplitudes. And then basically um, they formulate a great restriction rule. So that is a statement about how these subcategories look in case you can transport the brain smoothly from one phase to another. So great restriction rule is, tells us something about the, yeah, also about these uh, subcategories that realize phase brains inside the GLSM. Um, okay, so the results on deep brain transports are in agreement and um, yeah, what we use in, uh, in our approach is basically defects that, that allows us also to give a completely functorial approach to this uh, transport with an explicit operator that acts on the objects as well as morphisms in a straightforward manner. And yeah, basically we restrict to the topological sector describing the meta multiplets and use the rigidity of supersymmetry and defect constructions. Okay, um, so that's almost already the conclusions, but I would like to fill in um, the constructions that I advertised or the general picture that I outlined with a little bit of need to give an idea about the formulas that enter. So maybe this would again be a good point to ask questions. And then I will try to be more technical, at least a bit more technical. Are there any questions? So this again is the thing I would like to explain. So how do I get these guys to embed these in here and then to, to make this an explicit operation? Okay, then I continue um, again with a simple picture. So we had this uh, free boson idea where I, try to say that we want to look at a diagonal brain on S1 times S1 or general geometric pictures on some M that we embed in the product diagonally um, in the target space picture. And in what I'm going to talk about, we talk about, we would like to talk about uh, polynomial rings. So you might want to think some baby algebraic geometry version where geometry is encoded in some uh, polynomial rings and geometries are specified by dividing out ideals from these polynomial rings that then specify your geometry. So let's say our model is given by some polynomial rings uh, C of X. So these might be several variables and this replaces one of these M's. So this replaces one of these M's. And then I have another one and um, 
I take a tensor product of C of X with itself over the complex numbers. So it's good to relabel the variables and we get polynomial ring C of X and Y. Then what's the diagonal? Well, it's the diagonal. So we want to mod out by an ideal generated by X minus Y to get a module that we associate to the identity defect at C of X, Y modulo X, the ideal generated by X minus Y. Then often we replace such things by simpler stuff. So we write down some resolution. Um, so some sequence like this um, that resolves this uh, kind of more complicated uh, thing. Um, so that would be my identity defect modeled by this module. And my brains sit only on one side. So they are boundaries for one of the series, one of these series here. So they are described by some polynomial ring modulo some ideal. Uh, for example, um, I take the, the y variables and mod out by some y to the n and then this simple identity defect acts on the simple D brain by merging. So let's say I have Y variables here. This is my boundary for the Y, y variables and my X variables are on the other side of the defect. And now if I want to pull this over here, this amounts to taking tensor product over the Y variables. And it just means that um, I, transfer y variables to x variables like identity defects are supposed to do. Okay, so now my setting is a little bit different, but almost the same. So I want to talk about Landau Ginsburg models and their OB faults and their, um, the objects are matrix factorizations of the difference of the superpotential of uh, two theories. So I have some theory in X variables and some theory in X prime variables as specified by superpotentials and separated by a defect. Um, so now it's almost the same, except this is related to categories of singularity. So what I regard as resolving by simple things has slightly changed. And indeed um, we need to look at two periodic resolutions of, um, of uh, our objects um, and uh, this, this kind of is what matrix factorizations do. But still things look quite different, uh, look quite similar to the, to the toy examples. So if I have, uh, if I want to look at an identity defect for a Landau Ginsburg model, it's a matrix factorization of W in the one variables minus W in the other variables. And I use the map X minus X prime precisely like in the toy example, just that then I also have a map P zero that goes in the other direction. So that means if you write this, you can make this sort of two periodic um, and, and so on and let this turn into let this resolve uh, a co-kernel of, of this map. Okay, so be it whatever. Um, so now I have described a class of, uh, I have described what are identity defects for Landau Ginsburg models. So for one of the phases, but for almost for one of the phases, but we still have a finite orbifold group to be modded out. So we need to have Landau Ginsburg orbifolds. Um, so forget the concrete description of the um, defects of a single Landau Ginsburg model, be it what it be. Um, you can use standard orbifold constructions to go to the, uh, to construct an identity defect of an orbifold theory. So for this, you just need to sum up images under the orbifold group. Um, so in our case, um, we have, so if, for example, if the superpotential is X to the D, there's a symmetry group ZD that we need to mod out by. It's generated by the symmetry operation and we can write down 
a defect that implements the symmetry operation. And in terms of matrix factorizations, it, uh, instead of modding out by X minus Y, we mod out by X minus symmetry operation on Y. So we can construct it as long as the orbifold group is discrete. So now for this gauge linear sigma model, we need to deal with continuous orbifolds. And um, this, um, we can also construct uh, an identity defect for these continuous orbifolds in the models at hand by introducing new defect fields, um, alpha and alpha to the minus one, I call them. Um, in particular, I want to implement alpha times alpha to the minus one equals one. That's why this is called alpha to the minus one. And then to formulate the matrix factorization, so the identity matrix factorization, I simply replace these differences of variables by x minus alpha to the q x y. Um, so alpha has x and y have charges and alpha also has charges such that this becomes homogeneous. So if I do this, I can write my identity defect nicely as a module where I have some polynomial ring, this one. So this is a polynomial ring in all my fields that, have in, that I have in the bulk. And then I have additional defect fields that look like this and I divide out by these relations. So that's the identity defect of the gauge linear sigma model. And it indeed acts on brains as identities. So this is on the gauge linear sigma model brains as identity. So we have our main player that we need and now need to discuss how to push down um, from this thing. How do we go to the phases? So we have this identity defect and need to go to the, um, to the phase. Um, so we want to construct the transition defects or the flow defects that mediate between phases. And um, yeah, I like to explain this in the case of two different Landau Ginzburg phases and superpotentials. Um, so this is my initial superpotential. And um, P and Q have negative charge and X and Y have positive charge. And now I push down by uh, simply putting giving P an expectation value, for example, one and Y an expectation value so that I remain with this defect here. Um, yeah, so that's simple enough. So again, I look at my identity defect that I presented at the previous slide, um, now with the charges at hand. So this, these guys had charge D, so I plug it in and then I simply set um, P equals one and uh, Y equals one, and that's it almost. Um, so in addition to make this a nice finite dimensional matrix factorization, I introduce a cutoff for the alpha field specifying a highest power. Then I can only apply this inverse thing and this is then my defect. So this is very explicit and mediates between these to um, Landau-Ginsburg phases in agreement with known results. So in particular, now I can comment on the previous lecture uh, question, uh, at least very briefly. So this is, um, these are, these models correspond to N equals two minimal models um, for which we have, if the superpotential is really just X to the D, so they are rational uh, models there where we also have an explicit CFT description. And uh, for very few cases, um, it's even possible uh, to construct this defect line explicitly also on the level of, of the full uh, supersymmetric conformal field theory. Okay. Hi, so, hi Elka. I'm going to interrupt. We have about five minutes left. Yes. Okay. okay. Good. Um, so I have uh, 
constructed my flow defect that mediates between different Lando Ginsburg phases and reproduce known results. Um, so there are known results about these flows. And for this one can take the mirror perspective and look at A brains in Lando Ginsburg models rather than B brains in Lando Ginsburg orbitals. And on this level of A brains, there is a discussion of Hori, Iqbal, and Wafa that basically tell us um, what the brains are and what happens if I perturb the superpotential. So the brains are described by straight lines emanating from a critical point. So there's this point at W equals zero, and then they emanate in a symmetric way, such that I have D pieces of cake here. And each pair of lines in this piece of cake thing corresponds to a possible A brain. And now if I perturb, then this critical point at zero will break up and some vacuole will decouple from the theory and um, make some brains decouple from the theory. And yeah, now I have constructed this defect that is supposed to describe this stuff. And indeed my defect encodes precisely which brains decouple from, decouple by uh, if I perturb this, so, uh, this super potential by a lower order term. So that's all nicely in agreement. So the critical point splits up and some of these pieces of cake or wedges decouple and that's encoded in the flow defect. Okay, so very briefly in two minutes, we can also go to a geometric phase. So this is the super potential. Here I have my gauge linear sigma model. And now I put Q equals to one. And since I know what this defect is, this constructs me a transition defect between the Lando Ginsburg phase and the GLSM. I can rewrite it as a matrix factorization. And indeed, already at this step, simply putting Q equals one, I see that the subcategory that guarantees the smooth brain transport was also analyzed by Herbst, Hori, Page will be of the great restricted form. So exactly agrees with their results. So that's the lift to the GLSM. And well, now we still need to go from the GLSM to the geometric phase uh, that's uh, in one minute uh, straightforward using something called Clauer periodicity. So we integrate out this field P and restrict to G equals zero. So that just means that we look at precisely this thing that we obtained from this defect by setting um, Q equals one, and then we roll it up and get some semi-twisted double complex or complex of matrix factorization. That's it. And here are my conclusions. Um, so I discussed functors between brain categories of different phases of a GLSM. And I didn't uh, discuss, uh, is maybe not even the best word, so it's uh, constructed. Um, so I constructed the functors from the identity defect. Um, and it is all very explicit. And in particular, I can make this operation moving, uh, moving brains between different phases. So moving my defect over to this boundary completely explicit because this is just a tensor product procedure in the matrix factorization category, for example. So I make, I can have, I do have these explicit functors and they are given in terms of defects and for the case that these categories are different in nature. So for example, here I have coherent sheaves and here I have matrix factorizations and I, this defect shares features of this category and that. Okay, so my construction relied basically on what SUSY and the construction of defects dictates and provides a 
a alternative or at least one point of view on brain transports between phases of gauge linear sigma models. I presented a few examples um, that have U1 gauge group, but it's not very difficult or shouldn't be very difficult to discuss many classes of examples um, with higher gauge groups and um, higher resolutions. And um, for example, it's possible to go, yeah, I said at some point that for that there's a choice when I embed my phase into the GLSM, so that corresponds to different paths in moduli spaces, and by composing different T's and R's, one can, for example, also compute uh, monodromies and things like this. Okay, so with this, I would like to end and would be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Very much, Ilka. Let's let's give Ilka uh, a hand of applause. And I, there's questions. We certainly have some time for them. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Please, please go ahead. Uh, so uh, this 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 uh, this defect that introduced uh, that uh, that you call flow defects, is there a notion of a G function that can be defined also for them, such that they would account for the differences between the you know the G function for the boundaries or the brains that are related by this flow? For example, in the case of the, um, the A brains in the Landau Ginsberg uh, orbifold that you discussed. Um. So, uh, so, other... so there is a notion of a G function that would just uh, correspond to, so, yeah, so to compute uh, something where you have the identity on either side. And now you want to uh, sort of incorporate that. Uh, so here I have uh, different C's. So in particular, my right. C decreases, and now you want to have a notion of G function that uh, takes care of that, um, that I have different brains or something. That's so right. let me, for example, let me comment. So I've computed these G functions, so these Gs. And if I don't, if I don't take into account this, then all these G functions would be smaller than one. And if I let, um, so if I take W equals X to the K, and now if I, um, so this goes to Y to the K minus N or something. And so now if I let my K go to infinity, the G approaches one, but it approaches it from below. Mm -hmm. And um, so what one might want to think of is to incorporate something like people did in CFT. Um, so uh, for example, people, this is not my work, but uh, people um, normalized this with the G function of the lowest uh, Cardi brain, for example, to take into account that these theories are different. And this is something um, right, that but, one- but the, Right, but maybe my question is even more naive. Like, is it obvious that uh, the G for this uh, flow interface would be the you know the the ratio of the G's of the boundary, the corresponding brains. Is, is this obvious? Of what corresponding brains? So you know, so so you have this flow defect that transports brains in one Landau Ginsberg to the other. Yes, but there are and many the brains. brains will... So with which relation? So or it's not obvious. So your, the short answer to your question is it's not obvious to me. But also I haven't really understood uh, which ratio I should take precisely i see but uh, but uh, but uh, would you say that if just for information about the g function associated with this uh, interfaces between cfdlc and c prime but sufficient to fix all the g i mean the boundary entropies for the brains in the other phase obtained from the transport uh, yes okay because i can just i can move the whole brain so in particular i can move the g that's right. So, so yeah. the, what's what's not obvious? I think that 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 will be obvious if the fusion is well defined, and you will say that's the case in the supersymmetric after you do the yes. test. Yes. 
Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Well, um, we will have a discussion session tomorrow. I, th I think, uh, Ilka, you're you're coming to that one, right? The one on yes. Okay, so if it, we we can we can talk in maybe smaller groups then, um, or larger ones too. I imagine. Um, I can ask another question, Chris. Oh, um, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so so um, I, I'm just curious. I mean, if if, if you learn something uh, sort of new about, about about questions like you know the existence of a of a gradient flow, gradient RG flow, or did you learn anything new about uh, uh, the RG flows even between I don't know uh, these uh, different Landau Ginzburg models? Uh... Well, I do learn stuff between flows of different Landau Ginsburg models, but I think the answer I would give to that. Um, so yeah, what do I learn? So in particular, if you look at n equals two minimal models, there's not really a good perturbation theory because there's no small parameter. So it's very difficult to, for example, study how brains flow if you do relevant perturbations because there's no perturbation series. So since we have formulated these defects, this and the defects are in that sense non-perturbative because they connect directly the two fixed points, then you do learn something because you have an explicit map bet between the brains. So that's what I would have said. So yeah. I mean, can you do, I don't know, can you do things like find different, I don't know, de decreasing quantities or something uh, along our G flows or something uh, for, for, from this construction? Um, I don't know, more, more than say C theorems or stronger versions of C theorems or, or, or something, or maybe something about the geometry of the space of our G flows or something. Uh, the space uh, of our G flows. So I know Vafa, for example, had some, I don't know, some conjectures, I guess they were in the maybe 80s or 90s about flows between different kinds of minimal models. Uh, I don't remember if they're between n equals two ones or what, but uh, I don't know if you can make any of this stuff more precise with the defect picture. Um, I think my uh, this, this approach that I'm taking is a little too bumpy, <laughs> let's put it this way. So I have some big theory and into this, I can embed uh, smaller theories. And so I can talk about a space of theories, for example, and one could also contemplate whether, for example, this G function that we discussed before would be a nice notion of distance. So that's something that I studied in some other paper with, with Rastelli and Bachas, um, where, um, yeah, where we kind of use this G function to, to, to uh, define a notion of distance, but for moduli spaces. And now I have these relevant flows and in principle, one could use this G function to define the distance between different uh, theories like that. But I cannot, if I just, I mean, if I have this picture between UV and IR, I cannot really, um, follow the dependence on in terms of parameters. So let's say this is not UV and IR, but it's, uh, it's the marginal case. So it's UV and it's perturbation by a marginal operator. Then I wouldn't be able uh, with this approach to follow the parameter dependence of the G function at least not with I presented today. And the reason is that that's, so to speak, in the A-twisted sector. Um, so it's not part of my B, uh, my B-twisted sector. And this, the reason is basically that um, if I perturb the scalar uh, perturbations uh, that then, um, so I was looking at Kähler deformations together with these, the holomorphic sector, and then I cannot follow the full parameter dependence. I see, okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, anything else? 
Well, if not, um, let's uh, adjourn to the, the poster session uh, room and, uh, and we'll have a, another uh, group of three talks tomorrow as well. Um, let's thank, let's thank uh, Ilka Brunner again. Okay, thank you.